We're continuing with Leslie Fox of Tenable, and he will tell you all about some history and then onwards. So please give it up for Leslie Forbes. Hello, 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 everyone. Yeah. So some of you I might know, some of you I might not. Excuse me, but by the end of this, I think you'll all know me. So, um, yeah, I'm Leslie Forbes. I'm a product manager with Tenable. I have been with Tenable for about 10 years. Who knows Tenable, by the way? Everyone now. Why do I even come here then? So, um, for the beer, yeah, <laughs> that's the best answer. Best answer. Right. So, um, I'm not here to talk about Tenable. What I want to talk about is really where Nessus came from, why it's there, and why people love it so much. So, I think I think the the fact that Nessus passed its twenty year birthday, um, yeah, some time ago, is a really good testament to what um, what Renault created way back. So, in fact, Nessus now is older than what Renault was when he wrote it. So that's kind of a it's a very interesting way of of looking at the uh, at the perspective of it. And what what I've what I've sought to do is just try and go through, you know, some of the um, you know, interesting aspects. Just a quick focus on on what got it going, and th then to to finish off, you know, where where we are right now, and um, how we're we going forwards with um, with Tenable. Now, with, for some reason. This clicker thing. Oh, there we go. So, where did it all start? In France. Because Renault, Renault de Raison is a Frenchman. He lived in France. He studied in France. Went to school in France. And still speaks like a Frenchman. Um, every time I hear him, he sounds exactly the same. And while I was busy doing the research for this, um, I, I listened to some really, really old podcasts. And... His voice back then, so what, 15 years ago, still the same as it is today. So yeah, really interesting. So he was he was studying way back. Um, he had felt well. He was at college, um, wanted to learn a little bit about Unix. He had discovered this fancy thing called Unix way back in 1995, um, but he felt he was young enough and there was lots to you know learn from. And by about 1998, he'd started f figuring out, well, there's some really cool stuff around there. Unix is really cool. The fact that you can have multiple users on a system and uh, all be logged in at the same time and do things as opposed to, well, Mac OS, which was, well, single user and so on. Um, so he just figured out, well, there's things to learn. He'll go and learn how to do some programming. And, well, if you've got a multi-user system, you'd like to make it secure, wouldn't you? So that's kind of what the what the background was. Um, Satan, of course, was around at that point, not the Satan or the Satan. Um, Satan was the um, you know, security scanner for networks, but it really didn't work all that well, and and that was the sort of backdrop to what he did to create um, what what we see in this email, and. This is kind of what it looked like in the old, you know, I don't know if that's X window or GTK or whatever it was, but that was, that was the sort of output. And you know, it's, a, it's a far cry from what we've got today uh, with all of the fancy stuff. And don't, whoops, I suppose I should walk that direction. Um, don't even um, talk about the, uh, the flash interface because I know that people loved it. So that, that's some of the background, but why? Why even, why even make something like this? So, so after trying Satan, um, you know, the security administrator tool for something, um, analyzing networks, I think it was, he just felt, well, you know, what, what, what scripting tools were around back at the time, and that included Perl and other things, there just wasn't, um, there just wasn't something to solve the problem of, you know, auditing a remote machine. So version 1, which was referred to in that original email, was written in C. He went to learn C, C programming. Um, but the problem was that C is kind of a, 
very clever at tripping you up and you can do some very terrible things with memory and get seg faults and all those kind of fanciness. So he decided to write a, a kind of a scripting language and that was where Packet Forge came from. Packet Forge was the first attempt at creating a mechanism to forge packets. You know, what a clever way of calling it, Packet Forge. Um, so initially that was a like a, an interactive shell so you could tell it I need a packet that looks like this and effectively that was called by the C program to say hey make a packet that does this you know so this is the specially crafted packet um, um, thought process and that was created simply to get the objective of creating packets to in order to put on the wire and go and test things and, and get certain responses back in other words, creating creating a protocol interchange with with the target. So, um, with that in mind, that kind of went okay um, as a new language, and that was essentially the origin or the genesis of what we now know as NASL. So, this is kind of why I'm talking about NASL then. Na NASL is a tax scripting language, and over time. So this is like back in 1998-ish. Um, over time, um, NASL has become a very um, structured language, a structured scripting language uh, with different functions and all those kind of really um, fascinating things. And the, all the, the coolest part about the way that NASL's work together with these um, you know, NASL scripts was that th the, the scripts themselves didn't then have external dependencies. You know, so if you were installing on a system and you know, it was, remember it was open source back in the day, and if a, uh, a plugin writer wanted to come and write um, a certain plugin and he had a, a penchant for some kind of SNMP library, then you know, submit that to the, uh, to, the, um, to, the, to the project, and then somebody else comes along and then doesn't use that same SNMP library well, what are you going to do? You're going to have to fetch that. It just creates too many dependencies. So that's kind of why the um, generation of, of, of Nessus and Nazl you know, took on this approach of, um, of um, scripts, or plug-in scripts, rather. So the other really cool thing was that if everything is, um, let's call it housed within a plug-in, having the ability to control where uh, error logs and errors within functions and errors within the plugins would come straight back to, to the scanner. They wouldn't error out on the machine itself. So it's a nice cool way of, of, of tracing, um, back tracing bugs. Um, and the, the one cool thing, so I think it was like version 1.0. Yeah, so y yeah, in, in, the, uh, in the original um, um, Nessus, there wasn't even the ability to do um, SSL. Now, the really nice thing was that when version two came along, the, uh, you know, the addition of SSL just meant changing the engine and not one of the plugins required any changes. So, for example, it was, it was as trivial as saying, well, let's build a function inside of the engine that when it recognizes that there is a, um, a socket that it's connected, or a port that it's connected to, that it would then simply um, recognize that that port is talking um, SSL and would then create an SSL socket. And of course, then all of the plugins can then you know, follow suit. So that's one really, really good example of why, um, why the structure ended up the way it did. And by the way, this, um, this plugin, I, oh, you pro I can't, probably can't even point on there, the plugin code that I put on there. Is, um, is it happens to be SNMP, um, just complete coincidence. And that was one of the early plugins. Back then, plugins, plugins were written in C. And the, um, the stuff had to be compiled. Now, if we just kind of just jump forward by you know, a good couple of years, the, the um, the structure of plugins is pretty much still the same. It's still kind of C-esque. Who's looked at plugins recently? Who looks at them? Who writes them? No one? Oh dear. Okay, so plugins are really easy to write. Plugins are really easy to understand. And you don't even need to know C, to be honest. Um, but the, the essence of what I'm trying to say is that um, 
they're still written in much the same way and they're still compiled but they're compiled on site as it were so you download the plugins as plugin code but within the scanner when once the plugins are downloaded it'll then compile them into bytecode and then they'll get executed within within the context of the um, of the scanner so roll on a little bit of time and we have 2002 now the year before this um, Ron Ron and uh, Renault had met at um, at Black Hat and um, Nessus was gaining a lot of popularity so this is like four years after um, after after that original email April 98 um, Jack who's the one at the bottom he was he was running BizDev at um, in Terraces and ja uh, Ron on the left there he was um, he was the creator of Dragon IDS. So anybody who's that old and remembers the, some of the early IDSs, Dragon was quite popular back then. Ron was the uh, you know, was the creator of Dragon, and um, Interesis had seen the success that you know, Network Security Wizards were having with with Dragon and said, "Let's buy this company." And in the process of that, they got to understand one another, and they said, "Hey, look, you know, there's a common goal here. We can do this at an enterprise level." and we can go and secure networks and ron said hey but i met this really cool guy um who's got who, you know you you would all know uh nessus and um yeah he, he can he can come and join us i'm pretty sure that he would be interested so they got together and you know they found that there was a lot of common um common um, values there and and um that was the origin of where where tenable started so um it's almost 20 years since tenable has been going so you know that that kind of puts a little bit of um, of picture onto this uh, onto the um, uh, onto the slide, and the the other interesting bit was that um, already by that point, uh, Renault had started Nessus Consulting as a company in in France, um, providing support for you know well enterprises I guess who wanted to use uh, Nessus as a well I'm not even going to say commercial but in a, in a commercial environment. So the, you know, there were a couple of things that really helped them to get going. Anyway, time rolls on, and um, you know, the, at this point, Nessus was a client-server architecture. Um, they had done some really cool stuff. People had built additional clients of their own because, well, they could talk to the Nessus server, and you know, all the code was wide open um, and open source. But the interesting thing about what happened in 2005 well, late in 2005, was that um, the uh, the source was closed. There were books written on it already by this point. So big had the community become. Um, but the problem was from a from a corporate from a tenable point of view, because remember that this is now a tenable product. Um, from a uh, and by the way, what I didn't mention was that. Um, the, the basis that Tenable was formed on was to provide enterprise capability and use Nessus at scale. So, so simply in order to you know, provide for a, a real big enterprise, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of IPs, to be able to scan that regularly, you would need to have an enterprise console rather than just a single Nessus scanner going and doing its, its thing or what I commonly used to call a scanner in a briefcase. Um, now, the problem was so that, you know, there were customers, Tenable had natural customers uh, you know, in, this, in this enterprise scale, but some customers just weren't able to, or permitted is probably a better word, to install Nessus. Why? Well, because it was open source. And open source didn't have any kind of um, legitimacy in large kind of like government organizations and so on. And even today, uh, lots of the US government does not permit open source stuff. It has to be you know, supported by a proper valid um, you know, corporate contract. Anyway, so you know, they, felt, they, felt, they felt open source software, unreliable, no traceability. So that was one of the driving forces of closing the source and moving it to a proprietary thing rather than GPL. So why did Renault start with GPL anyway? 
simply because that was the order of the day. You know, all the blokes like Red Hat and so on were all doing GPL um, licensing. So, you know, it's just a kind of a matter of historical um, aspect. One of the other things is open source software, from, from a commercial point of view, is kind of difficult to support. And, and Nessus was a really good example of that because in its own right, it was just an application, right? And um, it was bundled in Debian. It was bundled in all sorts of Red Hat distributions. So, you know, there was the .deb files, there were the RPM files, and all those kind of various dif different ways of installing stuff. And their packages would package, you know, it in a certain way. And if it breaks, well, then you've got to first find out why is it broken? Is it the Debian version? Is it some other kind of um, version that, that is um, the cause of the breakage? So taking it proprietary was another good reason to um, to want to you know bring some structure around it and have you know like a, a single source that was authoritative. So the other problem with Nessus was that it was much more than just a software package. <coughs> Remember that there has to be research behind it. All of those plugins to do various things, you know, HTTP. Um, uh, what do we call those things? Banners, um, you know, looking at FTP stuff and looking at all the protocols and trying to figure out when there's new vulnerabilities coming out. Somebody's got to write that stuff, right? And the community was more of a community of users than a community of uh, contributors. So that was also one of the sort of decision elements that um, that brought um, that brought Nessus to the point where it was going to be a closed source. And of course, most people would know by now um, that there was this branch at that point, and that's where OpenVAS, you know, um, became a thing. So, um, not not that I'm here to talk about that, but that was just kind of like a, a side thought that really um, we should be, you know, considering. And one of the other things you know, in in a in a normal development environment, because now we're at Nessus three, you know, all the plugins that we're adding have to be relatively compatible with version 2 because, well, there's people still going to be version 2. There might have been still people on version 1. And in fact, when I joined Tenable, I'll come to that in just a sec, when I joined Tenable, that was 10 years ago, so 2010, um, there were still people using the version 3 server thing because they liked the client-server architecture. But anyway, that is, it is what it is. So, you know, bringing, bringing proper software development practices to, to software costs money. Um, and and that was another reason why you know, putting structure into it actually made a lot of um, a lot of sense. So I've made a point there that this was the first time that I got to interact with Nessus, and <laughs> I didn't really know it at the time that this was going to be you know where where I would eventually work. But I was working for a, a, um, a um, antivirus organisation, and. Um, I had just taken on my first role as a sales engineer and you know, all this thing's rosy and I'm really excited to go and do some work. They had bought a, um, a mail scanner, you know, anti-spam and all that kind of thing, but it worked on Unix. Not that there's anything wrong with Unix, well Solaris actually. But um, we said, all right, who are we going to sell this to? This is some of the best technology that we've got in, in the anti-spam industry. This was way back 2004-05. How are we going to sell this? So I said, well, you've got to find the biggest customers, right? They're the guys who's got deep pockets. So I was in the UK then. And, uh, well, I'm still in the UK, but the UK was our sort of hunting ground. And I said, all right, well, let's scan the, the FTSE 250. You know, so that's the 250 biggest companies that are public in the UK. And find out which of them have got Unix mail servers. That's really a simple thing to do, right? Because everything showed a banner and you could tell whether it was an exchange server or whether it was something else, Postfix or whatever. So um, I went searching for, a, for an application and I found Nessus, obviously. And um, I used Nessus to go and probe every single mail server and give me a result, is this thing exchange or something else? So really cool data acquisition tool. And I still regard it as a great data acquisition tool. Anyway, let's carry on. So as time goes on, you know, then we had to uh, now make this big announcement saying this thing is going to be, um, 
you know, some really cool development and there's a lot going on. We need some testers. And by the way, um, this is now going to be uh, closed source. Now, uh, does it actually say it in this particular screen? I think it does. Explain the roadmap. Yeah, there you go. How did you know that was going to happen? So yes, the that was the key part of, of Renault's message was yes, this is all this is still carrying on. We're we're commercially uh, uh, enabling you know people to use some of the best research going on. Um, this is going to be now version three. Um, the whole engine has been rewritten and is more than twice as fast. I think that was on the previous page more than twice as fast as the uh, as the previous engine. So there's really, really cool stuff going on here. But everybody thought this is crazy. Why are you closed sourcing this? It's supposed to be free. Software is free. Can't do that. But you know, the, the evidence is that that was probably one of the best decisions that Tenable ever made. Because of the amount of effort that we've managed to put into it continuously. Um, so the latest release that has just gone out is version 8.9. And, you know, we've I don't even know how many developers are on it. I'm going to make a quick guess, 15 developers. Actual developers. And that doesn't count researchers. So that could never, ever have happened in an open source world. Um, and it would never have become what it is uh, without having that, you know, capability. So with that, with that background in mind, it just meant that, you know, we could build um, you know, proper life cycle, uh, there could be proper support for it, uh, you know, people that, you know, that buy the license could then, you know, get proper support, it's very structured, there could be training programs because it was repeatable, and all those kind of things were really, really, um, you know, borne out in, in the years after that. So, it's worth pointing out that at this point, nobody's talked anything about money. The software was still free right but it was closed source so i'm just trying to think you know like adobe reader adobe reader well <laughs> that was a really really bad example that's what happens when you do things on the fly right don't go there <laughs> um but yeah so i mean there's, there's plenty of free software around you don't have to pay to do certain things mozilla firefox i guess is a really cool example but um yeah so nessus was still free at this point now let's let's kind of whoops that was way too quick that was not supposed to happen like that so let's kind of kind of just get accelerated a tiny bit by this point um we're moving into the sort of 2005 timeline what did i say so that was 2005 the previous slide so this is all of what happened like 2005 to 2008 and every single version had a very specific goal like i said you know version three was you know, obviously to close source it, but the actual functionality was let's rewrite the whole kind of um, engine so that it, it makes better use of you know, memory management and uh, the aspects of how it uses um, plugins. So um, with that in mind, there was already, I think probably a couple of years before this was when Newt, did anybody ever use Newt? Yeah, some people there. Okay, so Newt was Nessus for Windows technology. <laughs> and Newt kind of sounds like this tiny little thing, like, like a Newt is. But anyway, Nessus for Windows technology, because it was written proprietary by uh, Tenable and not kind of open sourced in the original. And by the way, one thing which I omitted to mention at the beginning was version one of Nessus was compiled for PowerPC. Yeah, and that, that's kind of because R R Renault was a Mac person. He still is a Mac person. He still is an Apple guy. Um, but, yeah, that, that kind of puts a very bit of an of a, of a interesting you know, hue on what the origins of it were. But bear in mind that at this point now that there are two branches of Nessus to maintain. There's one for Nessus, I mean one for Windows, and there's one for Unix. And that, that kind of you know, caused a bit of pain. So one of the, one of the next versions, I think it might have been version 4, um, was to try and unify that code base so that everything that was developed was developed once and then compiled for Windows and then compiled for, uh, for the various Unices. Um, 
and and even things like um, you know, like SMB, for example, wa was was um, was built in different ways as time went along. So there were specific you know times where um, SMB version one one was was in the way back, was in one of the early versions way back, and um, you know, there are various levels at which just introducing things made a made a lot more sense. So, <coughs> just just one example of why it's really cool to have you know, a single code base um, is that when when you write a plugin, say, to go and you know execute a certain um, system call, you know, you would want that to be uniform across all of your different operating systems. You know, whether it's find the time, find the network IP address, or whatever it is, um, you would want to have that consistent in the plugin, but different execution in various platforms. And that's kind of why having a unified thing together with all these. Anyway, the reason why I put this um, uh, screenshot out of one of the presentations that was um, in Tenable way back then was just to illustrate what the prices were. And that $1,200 price um, back then was consistent right through until when I started at Tenable in 2010. Anyway, why, why, I, why I'm pointing out these couple of things was that at this point, you know, think things were, well, how would you put it? Tenable was experimenting with how the, how the licensing would work best. You know, for people who are, you know, let's call them hobbyists, people that like to use Nessus at home, would still be able to get um, the plugins, would still be able to get the software for free. Remember I said the software was free. <coughs> the idea then was <coughs> let's, have a, um, let's have a feed which is delayed by seven days. So, you know, the home guys really don't care that it's seven days out of date compared to, well, me as a commercial customer saying, I need yesterday's plugins now because, you know, there was a vulnerability published yesterday and I really... Re 2008, that's config. So I needed the config plugin today. But config still exists. Anyway, so that was just a way of illustrating. By the way, Nevo was a really interesting product that had already made its face shown by then. That was the passive scanner. Network... Hello? Network Vulnerability Observer. Really cool stuff. Anyway, so let's move on. And... <laughs> yeah. Anybody who's used Nessus, anybody who's had to put a, a report out knows this thing. Anybody who's had to read a report will also say this. Right. So this, this kind of leads me on to kind of the where, where the output really starts be, being um, useful. So the thing about reports is everything that Nessus does is just like automation, right? So you need to kind of find a way that all of that huge amount of data, by the way, the, the, you know, a single scan can be megabytes long, um, full, of, full, of, full, of, full of data. But we want to have that in a succinct report. So reports were created. Original form was NSR or NBE, God, everybody knows that, <coughs> excuse me, but it was a single volume for a single line and it made it difficult to, you know, share between two different systems or for me to show you what I've done or for, you know, me as one part of a pen test team, you know, and, and join that together with data from multiple. So that's when the Nessus, the, the .nessus format came along and the object here was to try and put structure into this thing and it was an XML format. Yay! XML, the best thing since sliced bread. Um, unfortunately, that has stuck with us. So the idea behind the XML was to say, well, let's put some um, um, descriptors in here. What scan was run? What plugins were in that scan? Uh, which, scan which plugins actually executed? Um, you know, those kind of things. So there was a lot of complexity here, which meant that this output can tell me exactly, if I'm an analyst, can tell me exactly what it was that you set up your scanner to go ahead and do. Um, it would also list what all the targets were. So if you wanted to scan an entire class C, you know, 192, 168 or whatever it was, you would be able to put that in and you would see that that was the target. And this here is the list of actual live hosts that came out of it. So, you know, the, the, the one problem with that, with that structure was very simply that um, 
pardon me, that everything was flat, pretty much. So it was just a chunk of text, you know, and if the scanner was able to, um, let's just say, enumerate a list of firewall rules or you know, a list of netstat output or whatever it was that it was capable of doing, that would just be bundled in with that thing. So being able to then add tags afterwards is what really, really helped to bring a lot of structure into, into the... And by the way, that is still happening today. So, you know, recently, um, maybe early last year, a year before, you know, there was a bunch of tags added into the, um, you know, the dot Nessus format to say, well, you know, this is the first time it was scanned. Was it scanned with credentials? Um, what else do we know about this host? Um, there's a lot about CPE values in there and so on. So tons and tons of things. So as time went on, then, you know, then uh, more and more and more people just began to uh, use Nessus. You know, the past 10 million downloads, you know, way, way, way back. Um, right now, I don't even know how many um, thousands of people actually use uh, Nessus. And the downloads are just phenomenal. Um, so, you know, this, this is kind of the evidence of it is, is the, the penetration into more than 140 countries. So, yeah, it's, it's got a huge footprint, a huge community, a huge following, and um, it, it's just certainly made it one of the top um, security tools in, in the last 20 years. So it's still free. It's still free, even despite all of the, what we refer to as relentless innovation. And yeah, for me, being a, a, um, um, an employee inside of Tenable, it even looks relentless because every couple of months, there's a new release coming out, new release coming out. Um, so I've just wanted to try and highlight, this is just a corporate slide that I pulled out, but what I want to try and highlight are some of the things where you, know, you can see where Nessus has made a dent um, in, in the corporate um, face. So you know, just one example, CVSS3 was added then in 2016, I suppose it was created in 2015. But um, IPv6 was a really cool example, you know, and a lot of people still, you know, in the more recent years say, does, does Nessus support IPv6? Well, you should know that because you should be using IPv6 already. But anyway, um, I'm not here to talk about IPv6 and why it should or shouldn't be there. Now, so things like adding malware scanning, um, adding system auditing, that's been in for a while. Um, one of the really cool additions was the um, ability to do offline auditing. You know, so you could take a um, uh, start run config from a Cisco device and shove it in there and it'll say, yeah, this is a, this is a little pass muster. <coughs> One other thing which I thought about was um, patch auditing. So, so everybody knows that it's able to do local checks and you know, it'll enumerate what all the patches are that's been applied to a Windows machine and so on. That's all cool. But how about being able to point it at a Windows machine and simultaneously point it at a SCCM server? And let the SCCM server say, well, I know about this patches on this machine and I'm going to go and audit these things. Because remember, Nessus is black and white. If it finds a file there, it's there. You can't argue with the fact that a file is there and you can enumerate the, um, you know, the versions on files. So, you know, what, ha what happens then is the, is the, the scanner comes along with this data and will, will remove all the bits that correlate and say, oh, look, these things are different in the Nessus scan, and these things are different from what the SCCM tells me. Really cool stuff like that um, has all been added. So, you know, jump forward another couple of years. Oh, and by the way, I'm, I don't need to really tell the whole story, but um, one of the features that was added was a very simple conversation that I had with Renault, and we, we had a customer asking us to, to implement... Um, Something with a C, it's gone from, the name's gone from me. Centrify. So Centrify provides this capability to, to, to uh, merge um, Windows and Unix on the same network, and Centrify provides this kind of glue between the Active Directory and, and Unix. So, you know, obviously this customer had uh, uh, Windows and Unix networks, and they said, oh, well, does your scanner do this? I said, no, nah, I don't think so. DZDo is really cool, sounds really cool, but we do sudo. That's the industry standard. 
And they said, well, we use Deasy Do. I said, well, okay, let me go and speak to Renault. So I spoke to Renault and he says, hmm, nah, I don't think so. That looks too complicated. Our SSH library is really complex. So long story short, you know, I went and had a look at the code, just looked at the, SS, um, the NASL file, and this looked really simple. Just duplicate this because, well, DZDo turns out to be a binary replacement for sudo. Does exactly the same thing. So I told Renault, and he went away, and the customer went away and came back like two or three months later and said, hey, about that, um, about that feature, is that still being in development or whatever? So I said, well, I don't know. Let me go and ask Renault. Hey, Renault, what about that, um, that DZ do thing? Did you get a chance to look at it? Oh, he says, that was committed in the feed two weeks ago. Sorry. That's kind of how he develops things, just like that. Whiz bang. So these are some of the newer features. Anybody think that anything here that they haven't seen before? So live results, pretty cool, really. Um, the thing about live results is it allows you to, um, to store metadata about what you collect during a scan such that when, when you review that tomorrow and you've got an updated set of plugins to, you know, tonight, those plugins can infer that you've got a vulnerability on such and such a machine simply because of the enumeration that you've done yesterday. That's pretty cool stuff. Um, so where we're going with this, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the go. Um, yeah, some of the stuff relates to Nessus Manager, by the way. That's not really Nessus itself. Um, we're starting to talk about how you deploy this stuff at scale. Yeah, so large customers who use um, you know, like Tenable I.O., for example, which is our cloud platform, still need to use Nessus inside of their networks in order to go and you know, look at, at, um, at machines. So there's a ton of things going on there. We're looking at how we package Nessus. We've long had Nessus as the pre-authorized scanner in AWS. There's always been the BYOL. And you know, we're starting to look at GCP, Azure, AHV. That's the Nutanix hypervisor. Um, we're going to go there. We're even talking about ARM. Who uses ARM? And I don't mean Raspberry Pi. I only learned about this last week, by the way. So ARM is one of the latest things that's gone into AWS. And it's really cool. Uh, it's like many versions of you know, M4 instances and so on, but for really quick, quick scaling of, of machines. Anyway, you know, that, that's kind of where we are. This is what drives us to do what we do as Tenable as a business. And I'm really grateful that we've had um, time to... We're up, aren't we? Yeah. So, yeah, really grateful we've had time to talk about a couple of things and just kind of illustrate what the real big background is of Nessus, how it came to be where it is. And it's still there. It's still a long way to go. And um, thank you for your time and attention. So, thank you so much, Leslie.